Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you all today. So today I'm going to be talking about work that's fresh out of the oven. If you checked archive on Thursday, you probably saw that. Uh, and it's basically a follow-up on work that I did also in collaboration with Talish, Jose, and Eduardo a few months back. So basically the motivation goes along these lines, right? This is a talk about particle detectors, which you've heard a lot about by now. These are our favorite way of talking about localized systems that can couple to a quantum field in a finite region of space-time. And like the, the typical example, the, the paradigmatic format that we use is we have some word line that describes the trajectory of the detector, and you have an interaction action that couples uh, I'm writing this in terms of an interaction action instead of a Hamiltonian because I'm going to be using path integral, so this will fit better with the, frame, with the framework. I'm going to have some integral over the space-time volume form of some space-time smearing that dictates the location of the interaction between field and detector in space-time, some probe observable for the detector, some field observable, and a coupling constant that I keep for bookkeeping purposes and perturbation theory. Our most common example of particle detector is, as you've heard a lot by, by, by now, the Arnold DeWey detector, which is a two-level system coupled to a scalar field. There are a few variants that we can also consider, such, such as a free particle in the box, which was the first example considered by Unru, a harmonic oscillator detector, which is the one that is going to be most relevant for what I'm going to be discussing today, among many others. And since I'm talking about particle detector, I have to say that they are a very useful tool for several aspects of relativistic quantum information, such as a measurement framework for quantum field theory that can be made consistent with the requirements of locality and relativistic causality, an operationally motivated characterization approach to entanglement in quantum field theory, and a framework for extracting features of space-time geometry and topologies in QFTs, possibly in curved space-times. And I'm not making justice probably to many papers that could be cited in this case, but I couldn't fit them all here, so I had to decide on a few. So now it is a generic feature of most examples that we use that the detector's internal dynamics is approximated as non-relativistic, which is fine for most applications because the paradigmatic example is something like an atom that can be to a very good approximation be treated like a Schrodinger a non-relativistic Schrodinger equation that determines some wave functions for an electron under the, the effect of a nucleus. But in the more fundamental sense, if the detector is not point-like, if it's smeared, the non-relativistic description of the internal dynamics of the detector may lead to issues with relativistic features of the theory more fundamentally, such as microcausality and, co and covariance. And the easiest way to understand uh, why that's the case is because you essentially will have a single observable of the detector coupling to multiple space-like separated points that have given value of the detector's proper time. This has raised a lot of interest in measurement schemes and general models for probes in quantum field theory that are fully based on a relativistic description of the probe itself. And perhaps the most important or the most relevant example of that for my talk is going to be the fuster var framework, where the probes are given by relativistic QFTs, fully formulated in terms of algebraic quantum field theory. And they can be made exactly compatible with relativistic locality, locality and causality as well. Now, the goal of the talk now is going to be basically to reconcile these two points of view in a way. So I'm going to describe a simple model of a localized probe uh, in terms of a fully relativistic quantum field. This is going to basically mimic the first paper that I mentioned with Jose, Talis, and Eduardo. I'm going to show how to formulate the dynamics of probe and target field, where the target field here is the field that I'm trying to extract information from, via the, a path integral technique, more specifically the schrodinger kaldish path integral. I'm going to show also how the theory can be reduced to a finite number of unruh like detectors given by harmonic oscillator degrees of freedom, 
that you can just obtain systematically by just tracing out part of the degrees of freedom of the probe. And that will essentially draw the connection between field theoretic and detector-based formulations of local probes in a somewhat systematic manner. Okay, so the toy example of this probe that is fully relativistic is what we have been calling localized quantum fields, which is the easiest example of something that satisfies the basic constraints of a local probe in RQI that is also a quantum field. So basically the idea is you are going to take some quadratic field theory with an external potential that acts like a position-dependent mass term, let's say, just because I'm writing the total action of the probe as something like this, where now U is some external potential that can depend on space-time. And I'm going to require basically two things. F to, make life, to make my life easier, I'm going to assume that a metric is static. If you're more relatively inclined, I would tell you that I'm assuming the existence of a time-like killing vector field that's orthogonal to a family of Cauchy hypersurfaces. And I'm just writing the metric here in the coordinates that are naturally adapted to the killing isometry. And I'm going to assume that the potential in those coordinates doesn't depend on time. So it is invariant under the flow of the time-like isometry. And it is confining. And the easiest way you could imagine that is if there's some finite region where the potential takes a, a minimum value. And then as you go further away from that region, the potential grows to infinity. Now, if I do that, then I can basically, for, at the level of the action, all admissible field configurations have to decay sufficiently far away in spatial infinity. So I can basically integrate by parts the spatial parts of the Lagrangian. And what I get is an operator like, that looks like this. And because I assume that the theory is stable, I am basically guaranteed that this operator E squared that shows, it, that shows up here, that's purely spatial, satisfies the property that its eigenvalues are all positive. So I can write them as these manifestly positive definite quantities called that I'm denoting by omega squared. And the set of eigenfunctions that I'm selecting here, which I can always take to be real, satisfy this orthogonality condition with this modified inner product that is chosen such that E squared is Hermitian now with respect to this inner product. Now I can just expand any field configuration at each time slice in terms of that basis. And with that, I just plug that into the action. And what I get is that the action becomes the simple decoupled sum of a discrete number of modes of the field, which are just each of them described by a simple harmonic oscillator Lagrangian. Now, the property of the potential means that each of those VNs, those mode functions, is localized around the minimum of the potential. And in that sense, I could say that each mode is localized. And the trajectory of the mode is essentially dictated by the location of where the potential is. OK, now I'm going to introduce the second piece of the puzzle. That is this path integral technique that I'm calling the schwinger Geldish path integral. And I'm going to describe the basic elements of how the story goes so that we can all understand how, how my proof technique will, will work. So basically, the story goes like this. Take a system. For simplicity, I'm going to assume one bosonic degree of freedom that I'm denoting by Q here. Just for simplicity, the equations are going to be shorter if I write it like that. But I hope it will become evident how it generalizes to the case that we're actually interested in. And I'm assuming that it starts in some density, uh, in some state described by an arbitrary density matrix row. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to define this operator here, which looks like the adjoint action of some unitary, except that now this unitary can be different from this one. And the, the, reason, the way I'm defining this is by just time evolving. Like this is a time evolution operator according to the Hamiltonian of the system with a source term. And I see two different sources here. This is why this at the end will not just be a density operator. It's just a useful mathematical construct that you will understand the significance of in the next slide. Now the next thing you do is you represent the initial state in the basis of position eigenstates. 
So this is just adding uh, resolutions of the identity on both sides. And now you compute the trace of the final operator, also in the position basis. And the reason why you do that is because you want to make these matrix elements of time evolution operators in the position basis appear. If you do that, then you know that each of those terms can be represented as path integrals in the Feynman sense. So integrals over, over all configurations that start from a given position and end at another fi fixed position with now the source term that you added in each of the Hamiltonians. And that quantity, that trace that I defined before, that included two sources now, can be written as something like this. And this is what we call the schringer keldish path integral. It's basically a, an upgraded version of the Feynman path integral that is naturally adapted to evolve density matrices instead of computing, expect, uh, instead of computing uh, transition amplitudes. So, yeah. The, way, the, the reason why this is most relevant in this case is because typically we're going to be dealing with time-dependent scenarios, and we're mostly interested in computing directly expectation values. And for instance, once you have this, uh, the Z, the schwinger keldish path integral, you can compute, for example, uh, arbitrary expectation values just by the usual trick of taking partial derivatives or functional derivatives with respect to the sources. Now I just draw attention to the fact that those are now two independent currents or sources, source terms, and these expectation values are not necessarily time ordered, and the state row can be arbitrary. Uh, the stringer keldish formalism has a long history in many body physics and open quantum systems. I would also like to point out that it has been recently proposed as a central element in developing a field theory based uh, approach for local measurements in RQI. And for our purposes here, the reason why it's important is because it will provide a natural framework to see systematically how to obtain unruduit-like detectors from field theories. Okay. The idea is, at heart, very simple. Now you remember that we had a probe field that was a localized quantum field. You have some field that you want to probe, and you have the coupling between the two. We're just going to apply the same techniques that we had before. The field is going to be taken as just a free klein gordon field. And the coupling will be the usual linear coupling between amplitudes of both fields. Using the mode decomposition of the probe field, then we already know that the action of the probe decouples as a sum of, of decoupled modes. And you can just rewrite the interaction term now as a sum also over those modes where you can interpret the operator that each mode couples to as this smeared version of each field operator with a particular smearing that depends on the mode profile corresponding to that mode. Now, we also need to allow source terms generically to define the schwinger keldish path integral. And we can just do that by adding the usual source term, as you, would, as you always would. Now you can associate the source term for the probe field with a tower of source terms for each mode in the natural way. And now we're going to reduce the theory to a finite number of degrees of freedom. The way we're going to do that systematically is just we're going to assume that we only have access to a subset of degrees of freedom that I'm, lab that I'm collecting by some set A here. So the index N that labels the modes that I'm interested in only ranges over a discrete set. And at the level of the path integral, we restrict the probe sources to only be non-zero for the modes that are included in that set. And the last assumption that I'm going to need is just that I'm going to take the, the initial input state that I had as this uncorrelated state between the field and the probe degrees of freedom that I have access to, and the vacuum state for the inaccessible modes. Now, this is just a calculation that you can do in full, because everything is Gaussian now, and you're just computing Gaussian integrals at the level of the inaccessible modes. And the, result, the resulting dynamics for the effective probe system, after you integrate out and trace out 
the inaccessible modes. It's something that morally looks like this. I'm omitting a few other integrals here that don't make a difference for my argument. Where this thing here should remind you precisely of the schwinger keldish path integral for just a finite number of modes. And there is this effect of integrating out the inaccessible modes that can be solved in full and exactly. And the, like, the obvious thing that I should point out here is that this term is second order in the coupling because you integrated, uh, you, you did a bunch of Gaussian integrals and then you ended up with something that was quadratic in the sources that were turned on with the mode. Now, the contributions to first order in the coupling are precisely what you would expect from just a finite number of unruled with like harmonic oscillator detectors with uh, this select choice of space time smearings. And the corrections to the naive results are only going to be important at higher orders in perturbation theory. So at leading order, the dynamics is precisely reproduced by just your favorite finite number of unruled with like detectors. Now, a few comments about this. Uh, I made a statement about the leading order behavior uh, of the theory, but the calculation that I performed was exact, thanks to the fact that I assumed the theory to be quadratic and the, the, the initial states of the inaccessible modes to be the vacuum. So as long as that assumption is true, I basically uh, solved the, the calculation Exactly, and deviations from the naive unruh with model under those assumptions can be computed now systematically because you have the full schwinger keldish path integral. Uh, the assumption about the states of the inaccessible modes being in the vacuum can also be relaxed, and the conclusion that the leading order behavior would still be reproduced by the unruh with model would still hold as long as the first moments for the quadratures of the modes that were integrated out uh, are zero. And from this point of view, the non-locality that I commented uh, with regards to smeared particle detector models is very natural and very intuitive. It just comes from the fact that you restricted the field to a finite number of modes, and that is known to potentially lead to mild non-localities and violations of causality and the like. Now, I'm running out of time, and I'm getting to my conclusions. So the takeaway message is that we have drawn a connection between field theoretic and detector-based approaches to local probes and particle detectors in RQI. We have shown a systematic way to reduce or to deduce the effective dynamics of the probe field to any select finite number of modes using the schrodinger keldysh path integral. We've shown that at the leading order, the result that you would have obtained by just pretending that you had a finite number of unruled like detectors coupled to the field in the usual one of the width coupling would lead to the same dynamics for arbitrary input states of the probes and the field. And you can compute the corrections between the two models systematically at higher orders because you know how to solve the, the Gaussian integral for the inaccessible modes. Now, a few comments on things that are interested to mention in relation to that. Uh, the fact that the unruh de Witt behavior or the unruh de Witt prediction of, for the probe fields at leading order is precisely matching the calculations that we do with particle detectors means that you can basically trust to leading order all the calculations that you have already done with, with harmonic oscillator particle detectors and those turn into statements about modes of a localized quantum field. And in particular, you can do fully relativistic entanglement harvesting uh, using local fields as, as the probes. And this is also a work in preparation that you should keep an eye on archive for next week. It should come out soon. And I should also say that this method, one of the reasons I like this method as well, is because it also draws a potential connection between particle detector models and effective field theory approaches to, to particle detectors in, in general. And things that I'll like to think about include an effective field theory approach to other kinds of probe uh, descriptions, maybe based on toy models for bound states of interacting QFTs, maybe. And maybe you could ask something about the normalization group of interactions between probes and fields, which seems a bit out of reach with what I know so far, but doesn't seem that out of reach uh, technically, I think. And this is pretty much what I had. 
Thank you for the attention.